Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Mom. Dad. No. Elvira sat up sharply in bed, her body drenched in cold sweat. She had this dream again. So many years have passed. How to forget? How to endure? What's going on? Someone of the girls grumbled. Elvira is having a seizure again. She doesn't let us sleep quietly. Another replied. Elvira held back her tears. After so many years in this place, her character was hardened, but in her soul, she remained a vulnerable and trusting little girl, Elvira. Elvira Medina would turn 18 in half a year, and she was about to leave the orphanage. She was a lonely, unwanted girl. But it wasn't always like this. Elvira lived in a full and happy family for six years of her life. Was that little or much? That rainy day forever etched in the girl's memory, and for the past 12 years, she has been dreaming of this nightmare. They were going to go to the countryside. For once, it was a common day off for mom and dad. In high spirits, they were going to have a picnic in the forest. Fresh air, nature, bird songs, the day off from the city promised to be wonderful and fun. It rained at night, the weather was mild, and a light breeze was blowing. The place was not far, an hour and a half in one direction. Dad got out of town on a used Toyota onto the highway. Elvira was sitting in a child seat in the back, with Mom and Dad in front. Elvira was humming a cheerful children's song. A truck was driving towards them. What happened next? It seemed like everything was in slow motion, or maybe it was just Elvira's imagination and her mind, with time embedded in the memory. There was a very slippery stretch of the highway. Dad didn't have time to slow down. Another truck turned towards them, and a little further on, another one. The family's car was slightly swayed by the crosswind from the second truck. Dad tried to straighten the car, but it went into the oncoming lane right under the wheels of the third truck. Then screeching brakes, the smell of smoke, screams, and glass clatter. Pain and scream. Who was screaming? Was it Elvira? Or Mom? This piercing scream was still haunting the girl in her dreams. Elvira came to her senses in the hospital. All she remembered was that the doctors looked sympathetically at her. And she could clearly hear people whispering behind the door. Where is my mom? Elvira asked everyone who came to her. She couldn't tell if it was a doctor, a nurse, or a nanny. Nurses and nannies barely held back tears, stroking the girl's head. The doctor turned her eyes away and tried to make the girl stay here comfortable. One day, a woman walked into the room. She sighed and said to the girl, Elvira, you're being discharged the day after tomorrow. I'll come for you. You'll have to come with me. You'll be living with other children. It was the director of the orphanage, Anselmo Pena. What do you mean? My mom takes me to daycare. Where is my mom? And my dad? Where are they? Oh my God, didn't they tell you? Elvira, you had an accident. Your dad lost control, he was speeding, and you got hit by a truck. Your mom and dad are dead, and you miraculously survived. Elvira barely understood anything from those words, except dead. What does dead mean? When will mom and dad come for me? The girl was whining. Oh, what a disaster. I'll come in two days. You'll get used to it then. Anselma left the room and headed for the orderly's room. Who is the attending physician of Elvira Medina? A woman asked in a commanding tone. A slender, medium-height woman with short, dark hair and glasses was sitting at a table. It was Olivia Serrano, a doctor. First of all, hello. I'm Olivia Serrano, Elvira's attending physician. And you, I assume, are from the Child Protective Services? You got it right. I am the director of the orphanage. Child Protective Services have already reported to me that I need to take the girl with me. But the girl has an aunt. I couldn't reach her today. Maybe she'll take the child. Valerian Alonso won't take the girl. She has three children. 
She barely managed the funeral. Do you know the girl's aunt? That doesn't matter. It still remains a fact. I need the child's documents the day after tomorrow. Has she been discharged yet? Wait, Olivia tried to cool this woman down. The girl doesn't know yet that she's an orphan. You should have said it long ago. Don't worry, I've done it for you. Doctors sitting in the office exchanged glances. The whole staff pitted and protected little Elvira, and everyone believed that the aunt would take her and gently tell her everything in time. Well, Olivia shrugged. I'll call Valeriana Alonso myself. When Anselma left, everyone sighed discontently. Poor girl, the doctor at the far table said. In some ways, she's lucky. Her mother and father had no chances, but Elvira just had a minor concussion and a couple of scratches. What does fate have in store for her? Olivia replied. All right, I'll try calling the aunt again. Maybe she'll take the girl after all? Olivia went out into the hallway and dialed Valeriana's number again. Soon, Valeriana picked up the phone. Hello, is it Valeriana Alonso? Olivia asked. Yes, this is me. Who is this? The woman asked. My name is Olivia Serrano. I'm Elvira Medina's attending physician. It's your niece. What do you need from me? Valeriana asked suspiciously. You know that Elvira is left alone, right? She's being discharged from the hospital soon, and I thought. What did you think? Valeriana interrupted Olivia. These are your personal problems. I've already told everything to the Child Protection Services. I thought the girl was already in an orphanage. The director of the orphanage contacted me. I have three children. I've had enough of the funeral. Why would I need another child? I understand. Goodbye, Olivia hung up. The doctor felt bitter about all this. During her time working there, Olivia had seen a lot. She had seen children brought in after injuries, poisoning, and accidents. Many tears were shed in the corridors of this hospital, but all adults waited for them, hoped for the best, and wanted to take their little ones home as soon as possible. Olivia had encountered such heartlessness a couple of times in her 15-year career. The woman's heart contracted, and she headed for Elvira's room. Hello, Elvira, Olivia said, trying to smile. Olivia, a woman came to see me, but I didn't really understand yet. The girl faltered, tears froze in her brown eyes. The doctor sat down next to the child, stroked her hand, and tried to speak calmly. You see, dear, you can't go home after the hospital. Olivia found it difficult to say the right words, but there was no psychologist in the hospital, and given the nature of the orphanage's director, no one would be gentle with the new girl. Where will I go? What about my mom and dad? How difficult it is, God. Dear, how can I explain to you? Olivia thought bitterly. Elvira, you know, sometimes our loved ones leave us, but they are always nearby. They live in our hearts and watch us from the clouds. That woman said my mom and dad died. Does that mean they are in the clouds? Then I also want to go there. I don't want to go with that woman. The girl started crying. Olivia gently hugged the girl, stroked her head, and said, You need to live a happy life, little one. Then your mom and dad will be happy there in the clouds. My little girl, the doctor was gently striking the girl's head until Elvira fell asleep. Olivia hadn't felt this heavy in a long time. Two days later, Elvira was discharged. Anselma Pena came for her and, without unnecessary sentimentality, took Elvira by the hand and led her to her new home. There were the sterile, cold walls, painted green, in the orphanage. Elvira looked around. She was scared. Another woman was coming down the corridor. Are you new here? The woman asked the director. Yes, after the accident. She's assigned to the fourth ward. The new woman, Isolde Gutierrez, was a group leader to which Elvira was assigned. She took the girl by the hand and led her to the ward. Elvira, I'll tell you right away that there are strict rules in our institution. We live by schedule. 
Did you go to kindergarten? We have a daily schedule here. We wake up in the morning, exercise, have breakfast, then have lessons. You'll soon go to school. You have to study well. The woman was talking and talking. It seemed to her that she didn't care if Elvira was listening or not. Soon they reached the room. This is the fourth ward of girls. You'll live here, Isolde said, opening the door. Come in. Your bed is over there. The girls will be back from lessons soon, and you'll get to know them. Today is your adaptation day. From tomorrow on, you'll follow the schedule like everyone else. Elvira sat on the bed and curled up. She felt like everything that was happening was a dream. This can't be happening. I had a family, mom and dad. I had my own room. How can so many children live in one room? No, it's a mistake. And Elvira burst into loud sobs. Isolde turned around at the door. Don't cry. Weakness is not tolerated here. Soon you'll understand everything yourself. Soon, five girls came into the room. They were about Elvira's age, but at the same time, they were different. Are you new here? One of them asked. Yes, Elvira replied. Were your parents deprived of their parental rights, or did they die? Another girl asked. What do you mean by deprived? Elvira didn't understand. I see. You're a homebody. Another one said. Look, Katerina is sitting by the window. She has parents, but they want to deprive them of their parental rights. They sometimes come and bring her candy. And you don't have anyone, do you? I do have them, but they're in the clouds. They see me and live in my heart, Elvira recalled the doctor's words. The girls laughed. Elvira looked at them and didn't understand what was so funny about what she said. If you don't make trouble, everything will be fine for you. Listen to the caregiver. She's strict, but fair. And she doesn't like it when people cry and complain. You're not a tattletale, are you? Katerina asked. No, I'm not, Elvira replied quietly. Okay, let's go to lunch. Another girl said. Elvira couldn't remember everyone right away, and all the girls went to lunch together. Elvira had to adapt to a new life. It was very difficult for her. Not all the children were friendly, especially towards a girl from home. At night, Elvira quietly cried. Time passed, but the bitterness and pain didn't leave. She knew she had an aunt, her father's sister. Her mom didn't have any relatives left, and there were no others on her father's side either, except Aunt Valeriana. Elvira had seen her a few times and remembered her poorly. But she vaguely remembered that she even came to the hospital and said that she couldn't afford to have another child. Only later did Elvira realize that she was the extra child. Aunt Valeriana never came to visit Elvira at the orphanage. Some children were brought treats. On those days, the children were especially happy because they tried to treat everyone in the ward with candy. But time didn't heal the girl's pain. It only buried this trauma deeper and deeper, and Elvira cried at night, giving free rein to her tears. She quietly cried because of her bitter fate. So three years went by. One day, Isolde called her after classes. Elvira, I know you still cry at night. I understand it's hard for you, but let me help you. We have a lot of circles with common interests. You could go to classes there. So you won't have time for sad thoughts. Okay, Isolde, Elvira replied quietly. She began attending drawing classes where she met Sancho. Sancho was already 12 years old. He immediately approached Elvira. I haven't seen you before. Are you new? Yes, Elvira replied. I just started going to classes. Do you go to any other classes? Not yet. The caregiver said I have to go, so I came. A friendly relationship developed between Sancho and Elvira. Two months after they met, three older girls, about Sancho's age, came into the girls' room. One of them asked who Elvira was. Elvira timidly replied, It's me, what is it? 
The older girls asked the others to leave. Elvira's classmates quickly ran out of the room. Three older girls stayed in the room, and one stayed by the door in the hallway. You've been here for more than a year, haven't you? The girl asked challengingly. Yes. So what? What do you want from Sancho? Sancho is mine. I don't want to see you near him again, understood. But we go to the same classes, Elvira replied with fear and incomprehension. I don't care. If you don't understand, girls, help. The girls pushed Elvira onto the bed and started hitting her. No one had ever hit Elvira before. She didn't expect this. She curled up, covered her head with her hands, brought her legs to her stomach, and didn't even cry. Got it now? Yes, Elvira answered, sobbing. Don't cry. We don't tolerate weakness here. Marta concluded. Let's go, girls. They left, and Elvira's neighbors ran into the room. They helped Elvira wash up and comforted her. Elvira wanted to run to the caregiver and tell her everything so the bully could be punished. But the girl stopped her. You were told that tattletales are not tolerated here. But they were attacking me. I didn't do anything wrong. If you complain, they'll beat you even more, Katerina concluded. That's when Elvira learned her first lessons in the orphanage. She stopped attending the drawing classes, but Sancho found her himself. Why aren't you going to drawing classes? I don't want to anymore, and I don't want to be friends with you. Elvira turned around and wanted to run away. Wait a minute. Did Marta do this to you? He pointed to the bruise on Elvira's arm. I don't know. I fell off the bed. Leave me alone. Two days later, Sancho found Elvira again. She won't bother you anymore. If she does, tell me, and I'll put her in her place. And if anyone bothers you, tell me. I don't need anything from you, Elvira replied, wanting to leave again. Wait. Let's be friends. Elvira hesitated, but she realized that it was very bad to be alone here and accepted the offer of friendship. Marta, indeed, has stopped bothering Elvira since then. Only occasionally, in common areas, in the cafeteria, or in the auditorium, did she throw hateful glances at Elvira. But with Sancho, on the contrary, she talked cheerfully. Life in the orphanage hardened Elvira's character. She stopped being pliable and could sharply respond to a remark or a joke. But in her soul, she remained just as gentle and vulnerable. And only with Sancho could she be real, and he, as before, promised to protect her from everything. Elvira was 15 when Sancho left the orphanage. Marta, the same girl, was always around him, although he tried to get rid of her. They left together. Sancho was a full orphan. He enrolled in college and started working at a warehouse. At first, he lived in a dormitory, then he was given an apartment. Marta, unlike Sancho, had a mother, although she was deprived of parental rights. Also, she had a share of the apartment. That's why Marta went straight home. Of course, no one was waiting for her. Her mother, who had long led an immoral lifestyle, was an abuser. Marta was always chasing after Sancho, pretending she needed his help or advice. Especially when Sancho moved into his new little apartment, Marta literally attacked him. She often stayed overnight with him, but Sancho immediately told her not to expect anything from him and not make any plans. Marta pretended to agree. Sancho, for all this time, didn't forget to visit his childhood friend, Elvira. Elvira had grown up. She had become a beautiful young woman with big, sad eyes. And to this day, Elvira sometimes had that very dream, the scariest day of her life. And this dream always weakened Elvira for several days. On this day, the director of the orphanage called Elvira to her office. Marcelina Navarro, the new director of the orphanage, was appointed after Anselma Pena's dismissal. The children didn't really know why the old director was fired. There were rumors that she was caught stealing and was offered to leave on good terms. Or maybe it was just rumors. But the new director, who had been working here for about five years, quickly brought order to everything. 
There were no fights in the orphanage anymore. They had fruit for lunch and excursions. And the younger ones called the director Mom Marcelina. Though she was strict, she loved the children quite sincerely. Marcelina, did you call for me? Elvira looked into the director's office. In the office, there was another woman sitting at the table opposite Marcelina. It's hard to say how old she was, but she was trying to look younger. Although, of course, extra weight didn't help. Yes, Elvira, come in. Elvira came in, sat down at the table, and looked at the woman. Her face seemed vaguely familiar to her. Elvira, Marcelina pulled Elvira out of her thoughts. The other woman was silent, but clearly felt out of place. It was evident, judging by her facial expressions. It was unpleasant for her to be here. She was clearly nervous and wanted to leave as soon as possible. Elvira, do you recognize your aunt? You didn't say hello to her. She could. My brother didn't raise her properly, and here she wasn't taught manners neither. The woman muttered quietly. We dedicate enough time to raising children, dear Valeriana, the director replied gently. But in 12 years, you've never visited your niece. She could have forgotten you. Why blame the child for this? So what? I had no time to visit her. I have my own family, three children. Now I postponed my affairs and came. Elvira, the director addressed the girl again. In six months, you'll be graduating from the orphanage and you're about to become an independent adult. But you weren't born an orphan and you have housing. Your aunt brought the keys to the apartment. Your apartment, Elvira, where you lived with your parents. Upon this phrase, the girl's heart ached. Your aunt brought the keys and something else. While you were little, it was too early to give you this. Here, Marcelina handed Elvira a box. Take it. It's mom's box. Elvira interrupted Marcelina. Tears treacherously flowed down the girl's cheeks. She opened the box and looked through the jewelry. There was nothing special there, not expensive gold earrings or her mother's engagement ring. Elvira didn't even remember these jewelry pieces, but she remembered the box. It felt like home. The home that fate had taken away from the girl. Elvira, do you mind if these things stay in the safe in my office for now? No, I don't mind, Marcelina. This way, it's even better, Elvira replied. Valeriana Alonso said nothing more. With the director's permission, she left. She fulfilled her mission. Elvira, don't be sad. Maybe God himself has kept you away from such a family. It's incredible that she came for the first time in 12 years and only to give away the keys, Marcelina supported Elvira. I'm not sad about that. Just memories. Well, now go, girl. I will keep everything safe. Elvira really wanted to tell Sancho everything. About the offense, about the aunt who didn't even look at her, about her memories. But Sancho hadn't been coming lately. He's working. Probably, Elvira thought. It was difficult to study for Sancho. He had to work more. Marta, on the other hand, tasted the joyful life of a drunkard with her mother, and this pernicious life began to suck the girl in. And she was dragging Sancho there too. But to have a good time, one needs to earn well. Sancho received a small salary at the warehouse. It barely covered the living expenses, and more and more often, Sancho told Marta to leave. And so the day of Elvira's graduation from adult life had come. She warmly said goodbye to the girls and the educators. The director gave her warm words and encouraged her. Elvira, life there is very difficult and ambiguous. Remember, you can always come to me for advice. Thank you for everything, Marcelina. Elvira hugged the woman and said goodbye. Of course, Sancho couldn't miss his friend's graduation. He was waiting for her on the porch, then he escorted Elvira to her home. Sancho, Elvira said at the entrance. What? Can you come in with me? I'm scared. Okay, come on. They went up to the third floor. Elvira's heart was racing furiously. Of course, the hall was renovated after all these years, but it was still the same as in childhood. 
Elvira inserted the key into the lock and turned it, opening the door. It smelled of dust and mustiness. For a second, Elvira hesitated. She had a lump in her throat. Elvira entered the apartment and couldn't hold back her tears. Well, all right. You'll manage. Sancho comforted her. Elvira took off her shoes and walked through the rooms. The only furniture left was her crib and the kitchen table. The caring aunt kept the engagement ring, but she couldn't protect all the appliances. The apartment looked pretty worn out too. She probably rented it out on the sly, Elvira thought. And it was true. Her aunt hadn't missed the opportunity to make extra money. And while Elvira was living in the orphanage, she rented out this apartment. Elvira sat down on the bed. Of course, she wouldn't fit in it. It was a children's, but not a baby's, bed, another memory of her childhood that fate had taken away from her. Sancho was standing in the corridor, leaning against the jam. Elvira, I have to go to work. Sure, Sancho. Thanks for seeing me off. Sancho hurried off, while Elvira let her emotions out. She was crying like a child, but no one came to comfort her. By evening, she got up, washed herself, went to the store, and bought some yogurt and bread. Well, I'm not a child anymore, she said to herself. Elvira trained as a chef, and immediately after graduation, she got a job in a cafe as a chef assistant. They paid little, but she was never hungry. Sometimes the cafe director would ask her to substitute for the waitresses, and then she could earn good tips. She and Sancho began to see each other less often. The days off, when Elvira was busy, Sancho spent time with Marta. One day, Picking up the ads and bills from the mailbox, Elvira found a strange notification. She went to the post office, where she was handed a summons to sign. The summons had an address, a date, and a time for a hearing. Elvira didn't understand anything. On the appointed day, she asked for time off work and went to court. She quietly asked the secretary what was going on. Besides herself and the court representative, there was no one else in the room at that time. The secretary took the summons and said, It's about inheritance. Are you Elvira Medina? Yes. But what inheritance? At that moment, Pedro, Valeriana's middle son, was walking down the court corridor. Elvira's second cousin, whom she had never met. He needed to pick up a court order. Pedro had gotten involved with the wrong crowd and was implicated in a theft. But the court considered him innocent, and the charges were dropped. He was testifying as a witness. Though, after all, he was also guilty. Passing by the room for Elvira's case, Pedro accidentally overheard the girl's full name. He wouldn't have paid attention to it in any other situation, but by the will of fate, he stopped for a moment at the door to that same room. And he caught echoes of phrases, Elvira Medina, inheritance, large, from abroad. Coming home, Pedro waited for his mother to return from work and asked, Mom, is your maiden surname Medina? Yes, why? Were you in court? I was. If you are caught again doing shady stuff, Pedro, I won't bail you out again. And now we're in debt for the lawyer. You have to work. You're living off my and your father's backs. Mom, wait. Listen to what I found out. That girl, what's her name? Elvira, your niece. Did she leave the orphanage? Oh my God. Why do you care? I don't owe her anything. I returned the apartment keys. Let her live on her own. She's already an adult. Mom, please. Let me finish. So there was a judge. They were dealing with another case in the other room. And then they called Elvira Medina. I heard the name, and it sounded familiar. So, I waited by the door and listened closely. You should get a good shake for eavesdropping. Valeriana interrupted. Yes, Mom, I know. It's an interesting case. Did she get into trouble? Well, that's where she belongs. If they put her in prison, I'll take her apartment and sell it. I knew she wouldn't become a good person. 
Santiago and Lucia always cared about her so much. She's such a weakling. Come on, Mom. Pedro yelled. It's a case about a big inheritance from abroad. I didn't quite hear it all, but basically, she doesn't have any family left. Especially from abroad. So why would she get the inheritance? So, as I understood it, she's taking a pause for now. To think or whatever. And while I was walking home, I was thinking, does she have family over there? And if she does, then it's our family too. And therefore... Oh, Pedro. Valeriana pondered. You did a good job. Valeriana ruffled Pedro's hair. We need to find out what's going on there and who this orphan girl really is. And the inheritance. Valeriana gasped loudly, widening her eyes and covering her mouth with her hand. Santiago and Valeriana were never close. Valeriana was the older sister and Santiago was the younger. Valeriana always felt that their mother loved Santiago more, and she was just the servant. Of course, this was an exaggeration. It was just that the mother wanted to teach the children to be independent. And while Valeriana took everything to heart, at 12 years old, Santiago was already trying to earn money by helping his mother. All the household chores were on him. Their father decided to try his luck and went abroad when he got an invitation from a friend. Roberto was of a complex nature. He was a man of no compromise and believed that whoever was not with him was against him. But he loved his children dearly. His wife, Josefina, Valeriana, and Santiago's mother was a simple but touchy woman. She refused to go to another country, citing difficulties in the children's education. Who needs us there, Roberto? It's good to be useful where you were born. Josefina said to her husband, but Roberto still left. It was hard for him at first, but his faithful friend Roberto helped him get through everything. Once, he invited Roberto's wife and children, but she refused. At home, things were hard, but it would be even harder there. In the second and last time, Roberto invited Josefina when his business started to develop. But Josefina refused again. This hurt Roberto's pride too much, and he never offered Elvira to move again. He helped the children regularly. Josefina accepted money and set some aside. With this money, she later bought apartments for the children. But she also didn't allow the children to communicate with their father. So Josefina raised the children alone, but with Roberto's help. After losing contact with Roberto, Santiago and Valeriana never heard anything more about him. Josefina, the children's mother, died suddenly, but she managed to raise the children. Valeriana was reminiscing about her childhood and how her father left. She never heard anything else about him. Could he have learned about them? About Elvira? Well, if that's it, the inheritance can be contested. After all, she was Roberto Medina's daughter. And what about Elvira? She was his granddaughter and it was not even clear who her father was. Who knew how Lucia got pregnant? But Valeriana was Roberto's blood daughter. Her children were his real grandchildren. And who was this orphanage girl? Could she be a worthy heir to the fortune? Of course not. Go ahead, Pedro, take a walk mother needs to think. Valeriana sat down at the table and started to think. Now, it should be here. It must be here. Valeriana flipped through her old notebook. Here it is. I hope you haven't changed your number, my dear, the woman said, dialing the precious digits. No matter how much Sancho tried to hit on Elvira, the girl wanted to stay friends with him. But Marta was always there, ready to console his male ego. Marta took Sancho to bars and nightclubs. She loved to have fun. She didn't have a steady job, just some odd jobs. She didn't want to study. She believed that youth shouldn't have been wasted on boring studies and work. One should have lived for pleasure. But pleasure required money, and there was catastrophically little of it. Like attracts like. Apparently, that's why Marta was offered easy money. Marta, Marco said, was a random acquaintance from the club. It's just a courier job, nothing special. 
you pick up groceries and deliver them to an address. Why such a salary, then? You're not fooling me, buddy. Marta, why would I lie? That's how I make money. Look, if you don't want it, it's fine. There are always others. Why not? I'll think about it, Marta hesitated. Think, but not for long. Of course, Marta understood the scheme, but the lure of making easy money was strong. In the end, Marta agreed. Marta was caught when she approached the second address. She had prohibited substances in her possession. Of course, she shouted that it wasn't hers and that she was set up. Of course, Marco, who wasn't really Marco at all and whom she had only seen three times in her life, didn't respond. And his number was registered to some old man from another region. Marta was in the detention center. Once, Sancho came to see her. What have you done? How? How did you get involved in this? The young man shouted at her. Sancho, it's not me. I was just delivering groceries. Just groceries, you know? They planted these on me, she nodded towards the people in uniform. Marta was awaiting her trial, and Sancho continued to visit her. But he also started visiting Elvira more often. Now Marta wasn't in the way, and Sancho had time to think about how to win Elvira's heart. Valeriana was sitting in the kitchen and decided to make a call. Anselma? Hello, the woman answered. It's Valeriana. I have something to discuss with you. Can we meet? I think I remember you. You're the aunt of one of the girls from the orphanage. Yes, that's right. It's about a very serious matter. Well then, let's meet at the cafe at 6 p.m. Good, thank you. Valeriana thanked the former director of the orphanage. Marta was sentenced to three years, considering her young age. Sancho told Elvira about Marta. Elvira, of course, expressed sympathy, but she couldn't understand why Marta would take such a step. Yes, of course, going to work every day was much harder, but breaking the law. Elvira couldn't understand that. And Elvira also realized that she and Sancho had different goals. Sancho had dropped out of college and rarely came to work. He was always looking for something new and lucrative. Elvira couldn't just get rid of him immediately. She started to distance herself from him. Plus, the girl didn't have much free time. At the appointed hour and in the appointed place, two women met to discuss a matter related to a young girl. Anselma, Valeriana began a difficult conversation. You were the director for a long time, and you, more than anyone, know everything about these children. I want to clarify with you, did anyone visit Elvira Medina while she was there? Were there any letters or packages, maybe even from abroad? I remember Elvira well. She was a bit of a home princess. There was one guy who was interested in her, but she turned him down. By the way, this incident became one of the reasons for my dismissal. Well, at least they let me resign, not because of incompetence. Definitely, no one visited Elvira. She didn't receive any packages. Not a single toy or candy during the entire time, as if she were a complete orphan. No one ever asked about her, that's for sure. Why do you ask? And why is this so important? Anselma said. You see, here's the thing. We happen to find out that Elvira is entitled to some inheritance. She has already been to court. The inheritance, apparently, is quite significant. But it's most likely the estate of my father, Elvira's grandfather. But in that case, we want our share too. And this little minx didn't even tell us anything. We'll take what's rightfully ours, but this sly one needs to be taught a lesson. So here's my question. Will you help us prove that Elvira is an unworthy heir? Or that she needs guardianship from her relatives? That's an interesting proposal. But any case requires money. Anselma, as far as I know, everything should be going quite well there, and I won't offend you. We just need to act together. Well then, let's give it a try. I'll dig up the old records, find out something, and then we'll meet and discuss everything with you. Sancho once again asked Elvira to visit her. Her apartment was cozy and clean. 
Elvira had bought some furniture and necessary appliances on installments. She could always cook well. Sancho didn't always bother to think that groceries cost money too. He was an orphan and it didn't allow him to analyze. He was used to coming to the dining room. There was always food. He didn't think about where they got the groceries or who cooked them. That night, Sancho decided to act. Marta was sentenced. He no longer had a woman. After dinner, Sancho suggested watching TV. He sat closer to Elvira and, at some point, began to harass the girl. At first, Elvira jokingly pushed him away, but Sancho was persistent. His behavior started to annoy her, but the girl firmly said, Sancho, you better go. Sancho looked at Elvira and hesitated for a moment. Fine then, he said, put on his shoes, and left. He was mad. What else does this girl want? Is she waiting for a prince? Who needs her? She's just an orphan, just like me. Sancho was angry with Elvira, but nonetheless, he didn't intend to give up his goal. It was time for the second inheritance court hearing. Elvira had looked through old photos and some documents by that time. She didn't know anything about her grandfather, Roberto, but she decided to assert her rights to inheritance. After all, no one would help her in this life, and it was very difficult to do everything alone. Elvira was surprised when she bumped into Valeriana in the hallway. Valeriana? Hello, Elvira greeted. What, Elvira, are you scheming behind our backs? Are you not ashamed to deceive your own family? I haven't deceived anyone. What are you talking about? Then why are you here now? To get other people's property? No, the girl faltered. I was summoned, and I came. Look at her, you're such a cunning thing. Know that you won't get to see my late father's estate. You better give up yourself. Elvira stepped aside, not wanting to continue these quarrels. Valeriana kept busy on all fronts. She hired a lawyer to contest the inheritance, while Anselmo was doing her own thing. This time, the hearing was also unsuccessful. After receiving documents from the lawyer, the court scheduled the next hearing due to the appearance of new heirs. Sancho was coming from his part-time job in a bad mood. They paid too little again, his house was upside down, and Elvira wouldn't let him in. What was he to do? He had already reached the entrance when suddenly someone familiar called out to him. Sancho? Sancho Moya? Sancho stopped and turned around. Anselma Pena? It's me, hi. Sancho, I need to talk to you, the woman said. Well, come on. Unfortunately, I have no sweets at home. Don't worry, Sancho, I've got goodies, the former orphanage director said. They went into the boy's modest apartment. Anselma began to pull out some food from her bag, sausages, cheese, and candies. It's harder for men to adapt to running a household. You, I see, haven't learned it in three years, Sancho. I'm a man. A woman should be the one running the household. My job is to work, Sancho said. He thought about Elvira and then started getting angry again. Who do you date, Sancho? I remember all the passions about you. Girls fought over you. The woman laughed. They didn't fight, Sancho was embarrassed. Marta always thought too much of herself and got what she deserved. And Elvira, forget it. Anselma, using all her communication skills, found out everything she needed to know from Sancho. This information would be enough for a whole dossier. And Anselma began to subtly cultivate and stoke Sancho's hatred for Elvira. Elvira needed enemies, and Anselma would ensure that this girl had them. Soon, Anselma and Valeriana met again. So, how's it going? The former orphanage director asked. The court has taken into consideration that there might be more heirs. But that's not enough for us. From what I understand, there is a whole estate there. We can't let that go. What about you? Valeriana asked. Good. I also have news. 
Elvira was involved with a guy in the orphanage, Sancho, who was a few years older than her. It probably won't help, of course. I've got my eye on him. But Sancho loves Elvira and is mad at her for rejecting him. Sancho used to have another girl, Marta. She was also chasing after him from the orphanage. They graduated in the same year and, apparently, were together. But Marta got caught for drug use. We should attach this to Elvira's case and present it as if the three of them went to shady places together. They just caught Marta and they managed to get away with it. I'll make it up, write everything as it should be. She ran away, didn't study, was disobedient. It's no wonder she got involved with such a group when she left the orphanage. Elvira had strange feelings after the court. Her aunt's words had deeply wounded her. She hadn't deceived anyone, and the thought hadn't even crossed her mind. But this inheritance. Elvira continued to live, work, and study. Sancho disappeared for a while, and he didn't bother her. However, he met Anselma again, who gradually turned Sancho against Elvira. Elvira had everyone wrapped around her finger at the orphanage, and now she doesn't need you, dear. I saw the rat from the start. What rat, Anselma? Elvira is just different. The orphanage didn't corrupt her. It wasn't the orphanage that corrupted her, Sancho. Why didn't she push you away before? And when the inheritance appeared, she quickly turned her back. What inheritance? What are you talking about? She doesn't have any inheritance, Sancho waved off. A big one, Sancho. I saw her aunt. Oh, poor woman. Elvira will take everything from them. She's got an angel's face, but a poisoned and embittered soul. Why does she have an inheritance all of a sudden? Sancho started to believe this woman. It all seemed to add up. Maybe Elvira had become conceited. The grandfather left it, he lived abroad. And Elvira decided to rip off her dear aunt, who's the rightful heir. Think about it, Sancho, who you're with, who you've defended. Anselmo was pleased with herself. Now, Sancho would surely be on their side. The next day, Sancho went to Elvira's. He wanted to check whether the director was right or not. Hi. Can I come in? Sancho asked. Ever since Elvira kicked him out, they hadn't seen each other again. The girl stepped back. Sure. Elvira, listen. I wanted to say... Can you loan me some money until my next paycheck? I would if I could, but I can't. You don't just become a waitress, I'm broke. That's it. Sancho thought. Will you at least treat me to some coffee? Of course, let's go to the kitchen. Elvira felt that something was off with Sancho. But what exactly? They couldn't talk easily, and there was a storm inside Sancho. When they finished having coffee, Sancho made another attempt to get close to Elvira. In the corridor, he pressed her against the wall and tried to undress her. Elvira screamed and hit him. Sancho hesitated. The girl pushed the guy away and kicked him out. Sancho, don't come back again, she said to him, closing the door. Okay, Anselmo was right. Elvira froze for a moment. What Anselmo, and what is she right about? Our former director. She sees people through and through. Have you become too conceited, Eris? Sancho slammed the door in anger, causing Elvira to flinch. And he ran away. Coming out onto the street, he immediately dialed on Selma. You were right. Elvira, she, Sancho couldn't find the right words. I know, Sancho. But don't be angry, it happens. Listen, we need to teach her a lesson, but within the law. Elvira came to the next court session with a broken heart. Now she was completely alone. She had no family or friends. There was no money for a lawyer either. And why did this inheritance fall on her? She'd rather live quietly and not be bothered by anyone. She didn't know how to fight and didn't want to. Valeriana was ready for this hearing. She decided to firmly declare Elvira unworthy and in need of guardianship. And who would be a better guardian than her own aunt? 
Elvira was very surprised when Anselma entered the hall as a witness. What is she doing here? Why did Sancho mention her then? What's going to happen? The girl was worried. But what Anselma said shocked Elvira so much that the floor fell from underneath. I am Anselma Pena, the director of the orphanage where Elvira was raised, introduced herself to the court as a woman. What can I say about Elvira? We put our soul into the children, but sometimes children are tough and rotten inside, and all the efforts are in vain. Elvira, despite being raised in a family until the age of six, turned out to be such a person. Although, the woman reasoned, maybe it also started in the family. Valeriana was pleased with herself. She almost physically felt the money flowing into her hands. Meanwhile, Anselma continued. Elvira didn't want to study. She had conflicts with other children and even fought with girls. Not all children graduate as worthy ones, but we try to insert light and goodness into all of them. The former director spoke loudly. Later, Elvira started to run away from the orphanage. We found her and brought her back. Then we talked. But that's all a lie. Elvira couldn't hold back. I didn't fight. I was beaten once, but no one reacted. The court admonished Elvira to wait her turn to speak and not interrupt the witness. Elvira's head was spinning from all of this, but what happened next simply crushed her. So, not only Elvira, but also some of the other kids went down the wrong path. For example, Marta Iglesias. Marta and Elvira were friends even after the orphanage. And now Marta, a poor girl, got mixed up with drugs and has been convicted. But where is the guarantee that Elvira isn't involved in this? Maybe she just hasn't been caught yet. But that's a lie. That's all a lie. Marta and I were never friends. She was the one who beat me in the orphanage. Elvira was admonished again. Elvira, Anselma turned to her. You should accept your mistakes. Understand, it'll be better for everyone. You'll hardly be able to live independently, girl. I wish you all the best, and your aunt does too. As a teacher with a great deal of experience, I believe that Elvira needs a guardian, and you won't find a better candidate than her own aunt, Valeriana Alonso. Valeriana has been to the orphanage many times and wanted to visit Elvira, but the girl refused to engage. The strength of this saintly woman has been exhausted, but even after Elvira was released from our institution, her aunt didn't leave her. She brought Elvira to an apartment she had set aside for her niece. But Elvira immediately sold all the nice furniture and appliances and now lives in a half-empty apartment. And where did all the money go? Did she waste it, drink it away, or worse? No. The girl needs to be saved, and she simply must have a guardian over her. Elvira was quietly crying, but that wasn't all. Valeriana's next witness was Sancho. He walked into the hearing room with dignity and confirmed all of the former director's words that Elvira was friends with Marta, that Marta went down the wrong path, that Elvira manipulated other kids for her own purposes, and that Elvira was naive and helpless and could make the wrong decision. Elvira couldn't take it anymore. She got up and ran out of the hearing room. She hailed a taxi and went home. She fell onto her bed, exhausted, and cried bitterly. The girl didn't know that the hearing had been rescheduled. The court needed to get to the bottom of everything. Besides, some discrepancies with the deceased's personal data had been uncovered. On the next day, when Elvira came to her senses, she was convinced that she would renounce the inheritance. She didn't need any wealth at such a cost. She wanted to go far away and forget about everything so that no one would ever bother her again. She hadn't expected such betrayal and treachery. The next month, Elvira passed her exams at the college. She couldn't drop out of her studies. She quit her job and moved to a nearby village. There she had rented a house in advance, paid for three months in advance, and even found a job at a local cafe in the culinary department. It was spring, and Elvira really wanted to find peace away from all that dirt. Over the first week, the girl got used to the village life a little. At work, she was liked because she was diligent and hardworking. A young man, Domingo, started visiting the cafe. 
At first, Elvira and Domingo just exchanged glances, but when Domingo approached the girl, they got acquainted. Domingo told her that he lived here in the village alone, but often went to the city. He often visited his parents there, but his soul belonged to the village. Elvira didn't rush into having a serious relationship, she hadn't had any adult experience yet. But Domingo warmed her heart. Elvira didn't tell him her whole story, she just told him that she had been left without parents early on. She didn't like the city, so she decided to try living here. Domingo wasn't pushy, and Elvira felt comfortable and warm with him. At this time, another court session took place, which completely confused all sides. The primary heir to the inheritance, Elvira, did not appear. But another complication arose, which Valeriana's lawyer couldn't resolve. A decision wasn't made, Elvira was neither recognized as unworthy of inheritance nor as needing a guardian. But, worse yet, Valeriana wasn't even recognized as a party to the inheritance. Valeriana was at her wit's end. She had placed great hopes on the previous session. She had to pay for her lawyer's services at every session. But Anselma also pressured her. She demanded payment for her services. The former director wouldn't help in this case without a monetary incentive. She had no concern for anyone if there wasn't money involved. This vicious circle was tightening around Valeriana, but she couldn't retreat. What worked in their favor was that Elvira had suddenly disappeared. But the court adjourned the session again. At this time, a real romance developed between Domingo and Elvira. The girl stopped doubting and believed in this guy. Every day he met her after work, they spent weekends and evenings together. Domingo said that his parents had left on a business trip abroad. They would probably return in the fall, and then he would definitely introduce them to her. Elvira wasn't sure if his parents would accept her, the orphan girl. But Domingo assured Elvira that his parents respected him and would definitely accept his choice. Elvira believed in the guy, and after a month, their relationship moved to a new level. Elvira trusted Domingo because she couldn't trust Sancho. After all, these two guys were remarkably different from each other. Maybe the conditions in which they were raised played a role, or perhaps it was just their character, but Elvira was sure about Domingo. At this time, in a distant foreign country, a young man was collecting the last documents. His lawyer had laid everything out so that Alejandro could present a clear case. Alejandro had learned a lot about this case. He had to shed light on the inheritance case. Domingo suggested that Elvira move in with him. It would be easier. They could spend a lot of time together, but Elvira refused. The house was paid for until the end of the summer, and she had already gotten used to it. Let's wait until the fall. You can introduce me to your parents then, and we can start living together for good. I agree, Elvira, you're right. You're a wise girl, despite your young age. Another month passed, and Elvira felt something wrong. She felt nauseous in the mornings. It was difficult to work. The smells made her feel dizzy. Elvira started looking for a solution online and was amazed. After work, she went to the pharmacy and bought a test. In the morning, the girl took the test and looked at the two strips for a long time. She couldn't understand her feelings. Could she handle a baby now? What would Domingo say? They had only been together for a short while. But what to do if it had already happened? Gathering her strength, Elvira went to work. Domingo left for the city to look at his parents' apartment. He promised to be back in a few days. They spoke in the evenings, but Elvira decided to share this news personally when they met. Work was difficult, but the girl tried. Despite her excellent relationship with Domingo, she couldn't entrust him with her worries. She had to make a living. As promised, Domingo arrived a few days later. That evening, they met up with Elvira. Elvira wanted to take a little walk in the countryside. The young people went down to the lake. The weather was cool and comfortable. Domingo and Elvira were chatting about something pleasant and light. Finally, the girl said, Domingo, there's something I need to tell you. What is it, Elvira? I'm listening. Domingo, I'm pregnant. A pause ensued. 
I had a delay, and three days ago I took the test. Why didn't you tell me immediately? Elvira, it's such news. I don't even know what to say, Domingo was bewildered. He liked Elvira. He felt comfortable with her and was even interested in her. But a child. Domingo didn't even know if he loved her. I also didn't expect it and don't know what to do, Elvira averted her gaze. Elvira, what do you mean? What should I do? We'll have a baby, we're not kids anymore. I think we'll manage, Domingo smiled, but it was an uncertain smile. Elvira smiled back, she felt insincerity in Domingo's words and actions. Or maybe he was just scared and everything would work out. They walked a little longer, then Domingo walked Elvira home and headed to his place. He had a lot to think about. Domingo didn't rush to tell his parents about Elvira. He hadn't made up his mind yet. Late into the night, he thought about the situation and decided he couldn't leave her. Two of them were responsible for the baby, they would manage it together. The next morning, Domingo came for Elvira early, he decided to take her to work. Elvira was happy to see him, as if a weight had been lifted off her shoulders. He didn't leave her, he came. That meant they would be together. She was so tired of the bad things, all she wanted was to believe in the good. Elvira decided to register in the city. She was going there anyway for business, to stop by her apartment. Moreover, in the fall, she had to go back to school. They hadn't thought about where or how to live with Domingo yet. Domingo suggested moving back to his house. Elvira agreed. She called the landlady. She was indignant, but returned part of the money. Life together in Domingo's house was a little different from before. He turned out to be a demanding guy, maybe even spoiled. But Elvira put it all down to him growing up with his parents, and that was normal. The following month, Domingo went to the city frequently. During the week, Elvira worked. She didn't know what Domingo did during the day. He told her that he was doing some work online. The girl didn't ask too many questions. Every weekend, Domingo went to the city, but he didn't invite Elvira along. Soon, Elvira began to notice that Domingo would come back agitated and nervous. She tried to talk to him, but he just brushed her off. Time passed, but the situation remained unchanged. One day, Elvira brought up the question of the status of their relationship, and Domingo paused. Elvira, my parents are back, and I want you to meet them. But my mom's a tough woman, so I want you to be prepared. Prepared for what, Domingo? I don't know how to explain. Elvira, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know how she'll react to the news of your pregnancy. You're an adult. What does it mean, Domingo? Okay. It's decided. We're going on Friday. The week went by quickly. And now Domingo and Elvira were getting ready to visit the man's parents. Domingo was nervous, and Elvira tried to keep herself together. It couldn't be worse than what she had already been through, anyway. Domingo's mother greeted the couple quite coldly. The father wasn't home. He had stayed to work for a while. They had a family business, and they were aiming to enter the international market, so they needed the presence of a leader. Mommy, hi. Domingo kissed his mom on the cheek. Hello, Leonila, Elvira greeted Domingo's mom. Hello. I'm sorry, what's your name again? Leonila addressed the young woman. Mom, Elvira. My girlfriend's name is Elvira. I'm sorry again. Domingo changes girlfriends so often that I stopped remembering their names. Elvira looked at Domingo in shock. Mom's just joking. Elvira, come in. During this meeting, Elvira felt like an empty space. She felt that Leonila was overly protective of her son. Leonila didn't ask Elvira any questions. The girl didn't even have a chance to say a word. There was a clear feeling that Leonila had told the truth about Domingo's numerous girlfriends, and Elvira was one of them. There was no talk about getting married or her pregnancy. Elvira was disappointed. 
Two hours into this strange visit, Domingo offered to escort Elvira to the bus, and his mother asked her to stay. The girl refused the escort, citing that she was going to her own city, she needed to check on her apartment. And she was left alone. When Elvira left, the mother gave her son a stern look and asked, What was that? Son, I don't recognize you. Where did you meet her? In the village, Mom. She came there to relax. She worked there as a cook in a local cafe. As a cook? Leonila laughed. Domingo, you never cease to amaze me. Mom, come on. She's good, really. Innocent and kind-hearted, Domingo defended her. Okay, Domingo. But why did you bring this good one here? You've had better. I know you. You'll play with her and then leave. Plus, you come to the countryside just for the summer. I don't believe that village life will entice you. Of course not. What's there to do? But, Mom, there's one thing. Leonila tensed up. What? She's pregnant, Domingo said. Have you lost your mind? What did you just say? Tell me, this is a joke. Did you impregnate an orphan cook from the village? This is surrealism. Domingo, please tell me this is a joke. Not a joke, Mom. How can I just leave her now? Domingo, have you lost your mind? What are you even thinking? Have you forgotten that you're going to visit your father in the fall to learn the basics of business management? Or have you decided to become a country boy and run a farm? Till the garden? Domingo, I don't understand what you have on your mind. Leonila burst out in anger. Mom, but I don't know, Domingo replied timidly. Okay. This isn't your first time. Put her number on the blacklist. It's obvious that she's been to the country house. Am I right? Well, she moved there. We lived together for two months. No, you've definitely lost your mind. It's all because you're idle. Tomorrow I'll call your father, let him sort it out. You're going to him and starting to work. And don't forget about your studies. Your curator is already afraid to call me and complain about you. Mom, what about the child? Domingo asked timidly. She's a woman and she'll solve this problem herself. Something tells me that she isn't as innocent as it seems. Understand, my son, it's hard for an orphan in this life. She'll grab any opportunity, but she won't climb out of her situation at our expense. Leonila concluded. Meanwhile, Elvira arrived at her apartment. She took a shower and began to brew coffee. Sitting at the table, she pondered why life was so unfair to her. And Domingo's behavior, he didn't even say when he'd be back at the country house. And she didn't have the keys to his house, some of her things were still there. No, he's not that bad, he'll convince his mother. It's just all so unexpected, Elvira reasoned with herself. At that moment, the doorbell rang, and the mailman brought another court summons. The girl signed, closed the door, and looked at the summons, the trial was in two weeks. She threw the summons on the floor under her feet and went back to the kitchen. The cup of coffee was still untouched on the table. Overwhelmed with emotions, Elvira started crying. Will this ever end? How difficult it is. I don't need anything. I just want to live peacefully. I'll renounce the inheritance, let them take it, divide it, and just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. Tears streamed down the girl's face and dripped into the coffee cup. Four days passed. Domingo did not call. Elvira thought that he had already gone to the village and was waiting for her there. Sometimes there was no connection or internet there, and Domingo set it up through a satellite. Elvira tried Domingo's number again, but he was still unavailable. The girl decided to gather herself and go alone. The bus was leaving the station in two hours. Elvira had lunch, took a few things, and headed towards the bus station. Finding the right bus, the girl sat by the window. At that time, Domingo was catching up on his studies. He was studying business remotely at an institute. Soon he would have to go abroad to see his father. 
Elvira arrived at the village and tried to call Domingo again. He was still unavailable. The girl reached Domingo's house and pulled the gate handle closed. She rang the doorbell in silence. No one came out. Elvira hesitated. Domingo's neighbor came out onto the street. The girl didn't know the neighbors. They hadn't crossed paths before. Are you Elvira? The attractive woman asked. Yes, hello, Elvira replied. Haven't you seen Domingo? We were supposed to. The girl hesitated because, after that chaotic meeting with his mother, they hadn't discussed anything. Elvira, Domingo left. It seems like it's been a long time. His driver came. Here are your things. They asked me to pass them on. The woman felt sorry for the girl, another deceived city boy's girlfriend. What? Elvira's head started spinning, her eyes darkened, and she lost consciousness. Elvira came to the woman's house. Her husband helped the girl into the house and brought her to her senses. How are you, darling? The woman asked, worried. How do you feel? You said. Yes, Elvira, he left. Didn't you understand who he is? But what about the baby? You're pregnant, aren't you? What a disaster. Let me escort you to the medical unit. The woman, whose name was Malvina, and her husband, Fernando, escorted Elvira to the medical unit. The nurse admitted Elvira and sat her on a bed. So what is it? Are you pregnant? Yes, Elvira replied. The girl was pale. I have a pulling sensation in my lower abdomen, she added barely audibly. Oh, what a disaster. Lie down here on the couch. There's no room available. I'll call the city and get you an ambulance. Dear, there's nothing I can do. Meanwhile, in the capital, a plane landed at the international airport. In the business class, a young man named Alejandro was flying. He still had to leave the plane, go to the hotel, and search for a girl. However, he knew where to find the girl, but life is not always straightforward. The ambulance arrived three hours later. At this time, Elvira began bleeding. The ambulance doctors put Elvira on a drip and took her to the city hospital. Domingo never called and never found out about the misfortune that happened to her. He chose education and a good life. As always, Leonila was right. Elvira wasn't his cup of tea. Elvira lay in the ward and indifferently stared at the ceiling. The doctor came in and informed her that she had had a miscarriage. The ambulance had taken too long, and unfortunately, there were no more chances. We did everything we could to give you a chance to have a baby in the future. But now you need time and rest. While you're here, you'll be under observation. Do you have any relatives we could inform that you're here? No, Elvira answered indifferently. I don't have anyone. No one. Two days later, Elvira's phone rang from an unknown number. The girl immediately thought it was Domingo calling. Who else could it be? Leonila must have locked him at home. And he was looking for her. He was looking for her because he loved her and missed her. Against all odds. Hello, Domingo, is that you? Elvira shouted. Hello, she heard a male voice with a noticeable accent. It wasn't Domingo. Are you Elvira Medina? Yes, that's me. And who are you? Elvira's mood was immediately below zero. He still hadn't called. Domingo also turned out to be a bastard. A bastard and a coward who couldn't think for himself and hid behind his mother's skirts. Elvira, my name is Alejandro, the man replied. Elvira, I need to see you urgently. Where can I find you? You're not at home. They don't know about you at work. Where are you? It's a very urgent matter. I don't want to see anyone or know anything, the girl replied. I've had enough of both important and unimportant things. Elvira, forgive me, something happened to you. I flew in yesterday to help you. Please tell me, where can I find you? Elvira didn't say anything. She just burst into tears. She was very tired of betrayal, injustice, and lies. 
She had encountered too much deceit in her life. She couldn't take it anymore. When she started crying, a nurse rushed to her side. The phone was still on the bedside table, in conversation mode. Elvira cried and flinched. The nurse gave her a sedative and gently took the phone. Hello, she said. Elvira Medina won't be able to talk to you right now. I've given her a sedative. Wait, please. Alejandro begged. Yes? Please tell me where Elvira is and what happened to her. She's in the hospital. The nurse gave the address. What happened to her? Why is she in the hospital? Well, I can't tell you that. Are you a relative? Elvira said she doesn't have any relatives. I can't disclose the reasons for her presence here to everyone. Okay. Got it. I understand. I'll come. When can I visit her? The nurse mentioned visiting hours and how to find the building. Alejandro thanked her and began packing. He quickly took a shower at the hotel, found the nearest store, bought fruits and sweets, and went to a flower shop. He called for a taxi and went to the hospital. Elvira was still lying there, looking indifferent. The nurse came in and said, Elvira, you have a visitor. I told you, I don't have any relatives, no one. I don't want to see anyone. Elvira turned to the wall. Alejandro walked into the room. Forgive me, but I will still disturb your peace. Alejandro put a bag of goodies on the bedside table. To the nurse, he presented a cake and asked her to bring a vase for a gorgeous bouquet. The bouquet also took its place on the bedside table. Elvira turned and looked at Alejandro. There was a pause. Who are you? What do you want? I'm sorry, Elvira. I called you. We need to talk. I know what trouble you've gotten into. Your relatives have involved you in shady dealings and smeared you, but all their plans will go to dust. Did you come to talk about the inheritance too? I don't want anything. I'll refuse to accept it. Take it and divide it. Just leave me alone. No. You got me wrong. I'm on your side. Please, hear me out. It's very important. This was my grandfather's last will, and I dare not betray him. Elvira looked at Alejandro with suspicion, but still gave him a chance to explain everything. Their conversation lasted a long time. The girl cried, telling everyone everything that had happened. How she had been slandered, how her aunt had betrayed her twice, although Elvira had not needed anything from her. Sancho had betrayed her, and Domingo had cowardly disappeared. Alejandro listened and occasionally clenched his fists. He felt very sorry for this girl. The whole world seemed to be against her. Then Alejandro began to speak, and Elvira listened carefully, frowning. It was a difficult story, but the girl believed Alejandro. At the end of the conversation, they agreed that in two days Alejandro would meet her and accompany her home. And in a week, they would go to court together. In the meantime, Alejandro's lawyer had been busy and had prepared all the necessary documents. For the past few days, Alejandro has been by Elvira's side, not letting her spirits fall. He also made sure no one dared to approach the girl. The day before the hearing, Elvira had already come to her senses. Alejandro instilled confidence in her, and then the boy dared to say, Elvira, we'll win the case with such facts. But you must impress everyone from the get-go. Go to the beauty salon, get a hairstyle and makeup done, and I'll help you pick out a suit. They will all have to tense up in the corridor. After all, their entire line of inheritance claims will collapse like a house of cards. Alejandro said this with such enthusiasm that Elvira caught his vibe. For the first time in a while, Elvira smiled. She agreed to Alejandro's offer. The night before the hearing, Alejandro called the lawyer. He asked if it was possible to make another move in this case, with Elvira's consent, of course. They spent the night in the same apartment, but not as a couple, but as companions. After talking to the lawyer, Alejandro turned to Elvira. Elvira, this is an open hearing, but the case is very, very interesting. And, if you allow me, I could invite the press. 
Elvira pondered. Over the past few days with Alejandro, she had gained confidence in herself. Alejandro charged her with his energy. This will be spectacular. I agree. The hearing day arrived. This was supposed to be the last hearing. Valeriana was already rubbing her hands. She became very nervous and often complained of a headache. Anselma kept reminding her about the payment for helping to drown Elvira. And now, Valeriana was finally supposed to become the guardian of her unruly niece and gain access to the entire state. People gathered in the corridor. To her surprise, Anselma saw a new director of the orphanage, Marcelina Navarro. The one who had replaced Anselma Pena and whom the children called Mom Marcelina. Elvira warmly greeted Marcelina and hugged her. The girl wanted to cry but held herself together. Today, she would not give any ground to her enemies. Anselma was very surprised by Marcelina's visit to court. She nodded and waited for an invitation to the hall, clenching her lips. Sancho Moya did not come to the hearing. Anselma couldn't find him at his place of residence, and soon rumors reached her that Sancho was also under investigation. Well, he'll go after Marta, the woman thought. In principle, Sancho was no longer needed here. The press began to gather in the hall. Alejandro invited only a few journalists, local and metropolitan. Elvira agreed, and Alejandro wanted this case to be known. Valeriana and Anselma could not understand why there was all this fuss. They became noticeably nervous. Just before the hearing, Alejandro's and Elvira's lawyer arrived. The trial began. Initially, although it was not necessary, Elvira's lawyer invited Marcelina to speak. The woman calmly and thoroughly talked about Elvira. She did not know Elvira until she was 13, as Anselmo was the director at that time. But she knew this girl and had been involved in Elvira's life from the age of 13 until graduation. The judge listened attentively to Marcelina, clarifying some points. The character assessment of Elvira by this director was directly opposite to the character assessment given by Anselma. When Marcelina told the court the reason why Anselma left the post of director, she revealed the facts of misappropriation of the orphanage's budget, poor treatment of children, and much more. Anselma constantly jumped up from her seat and shouted, This is all lies. You won't prove anything. And eventually, the judge had to tell Anselma to leave the courtroom. Also, employees from the cafe where she worked and teachers from her college were invited to defend Elvira. Everyone gave Elvira only the best reviews. But this was just a small move from Elvira's side. And Marcelina and everyone else were warned about this. What happened next shocked everyone. Elvira's lawyer called on Alejandro to speak. He had to shed light on all the inconsistencies in this strange case. Roberto Medina, Elvira's grandfather, her father's father, and her aunt Valeriana Alonso's father moved abroad. He wanted to earn a fortune there. His wife and children stayed here. I do not know what their personal relationship was like. Perhaps this is a family matter, and it is not for us to discuss now. I want to tell you about something else. Roberto Medina was the best friend of Roberto Moreno, my grandfather. They started a common business together. The business went uphill, albeit not immediately. Roberto missed his family a lot. He hired people who watched and regularly sent him reports about his children's lives, and later, his grandchildren. But at one point, Roberto wanted to develop the business differently, and my grandfather, Roberto, did not agree. Then they divided the capital, and each went his own way, but the warm, friendly relations remained. I also remember Roberto myself. He seemed stern, but he was wounded and touchy inside. His business did not survive after another wave of crisis. He lost everything he had built for almost his entire life. At the same time, he learned about the accident that took the lives of his son Santiago and his wife Lucia, Elvira's parents and he learned that his own daughter Valeriana turned away from the poor orphan Elvira. At that moment, he became ill, and his condition deteriorated every day. I was still a child and visited him with my grandfather in the hospital. 
and Roberto tearfully begged my grandfather not to leave this girl and to help her however he could. And my grandfather gave his word to his friend, a word of honor. Roberto died, and my grandfather kept his word. He continued to follow Elvira's life. When my grandfather's state began to deteriorate, he called me and our family lawyer, who is now here representing our interests. And he wrote a will, according to which half of my grandfather's estate was to go to Elvira Medina. Half of it I, his grandson, was to receive. When Elvira turned 18, the process began. But soon I learned that there were some problems. Perhaps because the names were similar, Elvira's relatives had laid claim to the inheritance. But they have no connection to this inheritance. Also, we see direct falsification and manipulation on Valeriana's part, who, with the help of dishonest people, tried to defame Elvira's name. That is why we invited our witnesses. Elvira's honest name is no less important than the inheritance itself. Everyone present listened to Alejandro's monologue, holding their breath. Journalists had already seen this news on the front pages of newspapers and in loud sensations on television. Valeriana's lawyer just shrugged. I did everything I could. The bill for my services will be sent tomorrow. Valeriana grabbed her heart. The honest name of Elvira Medina was restored. Other lawsuits to declare her unworthy and in need of guardianship were dismissed. There could be no other claimants to the inheritance except Elvira and Alejandro. After the verdict was handed down, journalists applauded Elvira's side. Embarrassed but already confident in herself, Elvira left the courthouse with Alejandro by her side, holding her head high. Valeriana left in a daze. Right on the steps of the building, she felt unwell, an ambulance was called for her, and she was taken to the hospital. The next day, all the local newspapers were ablaze with headlines about the poor orphan whose cunning relatives wanted to deprive her of her inheritance. Journalists did everything right, the news spread online and on television. Two days later, Domingo called Elvira. Elver, my love, hi. How's it going? I missed you, he said, sugary. What do you want? Elver, are you offended? I understand, you're right. I disappeared, and you probably thought I abandoned you. But that's not true, Elver. My mother locked me in the house and deprived me of all means of communication. But I escaped for you. So that we could all live together, you, me, and our little one. At this phrase, Elvira had shivers down her spine. She was disgusted by Domingo's voice itself. But look this coward in the eyes one last time. Why not? Of course, Domingo found out about all this. The night before the call, Leonila called her son and, pointing to the television, asked if it was not this poor little orphan of his. With mouths open, mother and son listened to this news. And this time, Domingo, you did everything right. I apologize to her, blame everything on me. We shouldn't miss this chick. Mom, leave her alone, I don't want to again. Listen to me, fool. Call her tomorrow, you should obey me. Domingo listened to his mother and decided that maybe Elvira wasn't that bad after all. Elver, do you hear me? Let's meet. I missed you so much. No, Domingo, we won't meet. But Leonila made Domingo find Elvira. He waited for her at the entrance to her house, but it was another girl. She was stylishly dressed, with her head held high. She walked confidently out of an expensive car. Domingo noticed Elvira from afar and noted the changes that had occurred in her. Domingo called out to her, and Elvira turned around. She, of course, recognized the guide but simply passed by without saying a word. Valeriana was in the hospital. Her condition was very bad. A week later, she called her niece and tearfully begged for forgiveness. God punished me for all the evil I have done. The doctor said it was a stroke. They barely managed to get me to the hospital. But I will never walk again. Forgive me, my dear, if you can. Elvira told Alejandro about this, and she felt very sorry for her aunt, despite everything. Alejandro, 
Understand that they live from hand to mouth. And now Ant can't even work. They need help. It's up to you, Elvira. Elvira thought about and found an agency that provides the services of qualified nurses with medical education. She paid for a nurse a year in advance for her aunt. She thanked Elvira and Marcelina, but she did not want to take anything for herself. Then Elvira made a large charitable donation to the orphanage's account. Nothing held the girl here anymore. Alejandro was urging her to leave. What about the studies? I wanted to graduate, and I love working in a cafe so much. Elvira, with your wealth, you can graduate from the best educational institutions. I don't know the language. You'll learn. And Elvira decided. Together with Alejandro, they were leaving this city. A city that had tested her since she was six from all sides. A city that had tempered her character. Elvira, as Alejandro advised, immediately started learning the language. She completed several cooking courses, but it was difficult for her to delve into business affairs. Then she offered Alejandro, What if you take care of all the business, and I'll open a cafe? At first, just one to try. And then, if it works out, a chain of cafes. Alejandro agreed with pleasure. A year passed. Alejandro was able to melt Elvira's heart, and a month later they got married. Since she left for a distant country, Elvira has never returned home. She wrote letters to Mom Marcelina, and she had a particularly warm relationship with this woman. Sometimes she also wrote to her Aunt Valeriana, helping her get treatment. But she never indicated a return address, and Elvira signed all her letters, Your Niece Jane. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.